good evening everybody um i should say good evening for those of us in uh, the uk i know there are, uh, there's a lot of people listening into this webinar today and uh, we've got people from all over the world so uh good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you may be um today we are due to talk a bit about the issue of the slave legacy and the cases for reparations and i'm delighted to be surrounded by three professors uh, Varen Shepherd from West Indies, uh, Chris Manjapra from uh, the States, and Jeff Palmer, who's from here in uh, in Britain. The fourth speaker is Richard Hermer. Richard, at the moment, is um, on a um, inquest that's being carried out here in London uh, to do with uh, environmental pollution, where a nine-year-old young girl uh, is alleged to have died as a result of uh, environmental pollution. Uh, he should be finished uh, in time to be able to make it a little later in the session. Um, we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, that he can make it as Richard Hermer. Anyway, just a few words from me before we start moving to the speakers. Um, uh, I'm a great believer that each issue in history has its time, comes of its time. And uh, in a number of the legal cases that I've been involved in, not least with Richard Hermer. Um, that has been absolutely true. So one of the early cases I did in my legal career was to do with the prisoners of war of the Japanese, where they were very keen. This is the POWs who were uh, captured by the Japanese during the course of the Second World War, out in places like uh, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and for them, uh, the Second World War was pretty much all about being uh, victims of being captured by the Japanese. And the disappointment for them was at the end of the war, they kind of came back with the tail between their legs. And for the next 40 or 50 years, really just had to live with the fact that they, there was no massive uh, war celebrations at the end of the second, that section of the, of the Second World War with the Japanese. And uh, all they had to remember was the terrible treatment they'd received. Uh, many people said to them, well, they should just forget about it, that they should just move on in their lives. But as they kind of reached towards retirement, it was amazing how thousands and thousands got together and said that, look, this burning desire for justice in terms of what had happened to them at the hands of the Japanese remained much in their lives. And they came and instructed me and we then brought a legal claim that ended up with them being compensated about 10,000 pounds each uh, back in uh, two th the year 2000. And that was much to do with the how society had moved on and changed and developed over the uh, years between the Second World War uh, and when we were able to get them compensation. Uh, a second issue happened beyond that, which was we started to act for the Mau Mau from Kenya, the freedom fighters from Kenya. And there, Again, we were lucky that the uh, one day I was in Kenya and I knocked on my uh, hotel door at the Stanley Hotel and there were two old black guys and a white guy who said, look, we were members of the Mau Mau. We'd like you to bring a claim on our behalf in terms of what happened 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, to be frank, as a young uh, European, I'd hardly vaguely heard of the Mau Mau at that time. And uh, we were very lucky that the fact that... Uh, the history of the Mau Mau was so unknown to people, was really buoyed up by the fact that uh, over that period in the late 2000s, two history books were written, one by a professor of history from Harvard and the other from uh, the professor of history at uh, Oxford. And that showed to people that the Mau Mau had been treated terribly by the British. Uh, without those history books, we would never have succeeded in the claims. We brought the legal case against the British government which Richard Hermer was the lead counsel on, and we were successful in being able to get compensation for over five and a half thousand uh, of these Mau who by that stage in their 70s and 80s. And uh, as with the POWs, as with the Mau Mau, I think for them, for the nearly all of them, it, the money was really insignificant. What was the critical thing was the recognition of society that what they'd done in the, historically was so wrong. And I think that is a critical discussion today, I think, in terms of what we're looking at by way of slavery. I remember uh, journalists from the Times during the course of the POW case coming to me and saying, well, what are you going to be thinking of next? Slavery? In some sort of, uh, with his lip turned up. And 
uh, I'm absolutely a great believer that the issue is just is is now. It's one of uh, moments of history that I think that uh, the, the whole question about what happened in that slave era, but not just about what happened to the uh, the terrible circumstances surrounding the treatment of slaves in that era, but then what has happened subsequent to that to the families of the slaves to to the history of the societies that have developed on the back of all that slavery. And uh, I'm clear that with what we've seen with the death of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, uh, the throwing of the Bristol statue into the, uh, the local river, um, and even events like we've just had in Britain, the Afua Hirsch, uh, Sam Jackson uh, series on slavery, it's just all indicators that actually this is an issue of its time. A uh, moment of its time. I'm really so pleased that we've got three uh, such renowned speakers to be able to talk us through some of those issues today. We're going to start with Varen Shepherd. Varen is the um, uh, she uh, is in, she's one of uh, one of the main professors from um, uh, the University of West Indies, and she's also at the heart of the reparations uh, in the CARICOM group that we were involved in uh, getting getting together back in 2013-2014. And Varen has been working closely with um, uh, Hilary Beckles, a big figure in this uh, uh, area in the Caribbean. And she will be talking to us a bit about what's been going on in the Caribbean um, in her role as the Professor of Social History at University and also Director of the Centre for Reparations Research at that University of the West Indies. Uh, each of them is going to speak for about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll take some questions, hopefully by which stage Richard will arrive and take him. Um, but we'll come to the, the debate about questions in a while. But first of all, Varen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Greetings to everyone who is in this e-conversation, and thank you very much, Martin. The topic of my presentation is reparation and psychological rehabilitation. And this emerged out of my lifelong preoccupation with the issue of what it means to be a person of African descent in the Western world. In other words, this preoccupation did not begin with my work as director of the Center for Reparation Research, as one of the vice chairs of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, as a member of the National Council of Reparation in Jamaica, or even as a vice chair of the International um, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the CERD. Those roles were natural outcomes of my foundational experiences of societal injustices and my later study of history. Historical research led me to the evidence that the district in rural Jamaica in which I grew up was part of a former plantation named Hopewell, where enslaved people like Kuba, Mimba, Sue, Delia, Wanika, Ben, Ned, James, and Cyrus used to labor for the British enslaver Hibbert, who claimed compensation of over 6,000 pounds, while the enslaved got nothing but freedom. Further research led me to my great-great-grandfather Alexander Mighty, born into slavery in an adjoining parish to St. Mary, in 1829 and too young to get caught up in the apprenticeship scam. Recently, DNA testing revealed that on my mother's side, I am connected to the Tikar people of Cameroon. Neither the Tikar nor the enslaved people on Hopewell Plantation brought themselves to Jamaica. Who will pay reparation for their souls? It is in their name and in the names of enslaved people who were killed in the battles for freedom from European enslavement, including Anne James, Francis Duncan, Jenny, Eliza, and Jane Whittingham, all hanged by the colonial British in 1832 that I'm in this reparation movement. Of course, even though many in the Caribbean and in the diaspora have only recently been paying attention to the issue of reparation for native genocide and Caribbean slavery, the struggle for repatriate justice has a long genealogy dating back centuries the pioneers of the movement in the Americas were indigenous peoples and enslaved Africans who knew that their treatment by colonizers was a violation of their human rights and struggled against all forms of unfreedom. The 18th and 19th century enslaved led wars all over the Caribbean and the post-emancipation struggles for human rights 
economic empowerment and justice all continued the search for repatriate justice in opposition to the governing classes efforts to maintain slavery or recreate the mentalities and practices of slavery in the post-slavery period. In the case of reparation for Africans and people of African descent, the post 1930s advocates for freedom, democracy and repatriate justice were the Rastafari whose claim was for African redemption and repatriation. They were later joined by NGOs, academics and civil society. Since the July 2013 conference of heads of government of CARICOM, that body has aligned itself with this movement. They have set up a CARICOM reparations commission led by a core committee consisting of a chair and three vice chairs and a representative of the University of the West Indies. The CRC is expected to establish the moral, ethical and legal case for the payment of reparations by the governments of all the former colonial powers and the relevant institutions of those countries to the nations and people of the Caribbean community for the crimes against humanity, specifically the African Holocaust and native genocide in the wake of the Columbus project. Heads of government further agree that there should be national committees on reparation in each CARICOM state where none existed. One had existed in Jamaica since 2009. The CRC chair of the core committee and the chairs of national committees will report directly to our prime ministerial subcommittee and they have been reporting to our prime ministerial subcommittee on reparations comprising the heads of government of Barbados St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Haiti, Guyana, and Suriname. And this prime ministerial subcommittee pro provides the political oversight. Heads of government also requested that the University of the West Indies establish a center for reparation research to support the CRC. And this was duly launched in 2017. So that is the structure at the governmental level. But the Caribbean movement is linked and aligned with reparation groups and movements and individuals all over the world. In terms of the negotiating strategy, CARICOM accepted a 10 point action plan crafted by the members of the CRC. So this 10 point action plan begins with the restatement of the rationale for the reparation movement in the region with the CRC asserting that the region's indigenous and African descendant communities who are the victims of crime, crimes against humanity in the forms of genocide, slavery, human trafficking, and racial apartheid have a legal right to repatriate justice. And that those who committed these crimes and who have been enriched by the proceeds of these crimes have a repatriate case to answer. The CRC then sets out the charges against the transgressors, asserting among other accusations that European governments instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities. They created the legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans. They defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as in their national interest. They refused compensation to the enslaved at the ending of their enslavement, but compensated the enslavers, not just with the 20 million, but with what if we uh, monetize the apprenticeship um, the so-called apprenticeship system, according to Professor Beckles, then we add another 25 to 27 million. So the specifics of the plan are then listed and elaborated under the headings of full formal apology, an indigenous people's development program, repatriation for those who desire it, the establishment of cultural institutions, addressing the public health crisis, illiteracy eradication, the development of an African knowledge program, psychological rehabilitation, and technology transfer, which can be located within the right to development framework. And it ends with debt cancellation and return of the 20 uh, or uh, 47 million, as the case might be. And debt cancellation is, is, is there on the basis that the Caribbean governments that emerged from slavery and colonialism have inherited the massive crisis of community poverty and institutional unpreparedness for development. Overcoming these socioeconomic problems is a central part of the exercise of development and of the process of ensuring that freedom that will otherwise fall at the feet of underdevelopment. In terms of psychological rehabilitation, I turn to that now, second part of my presentation. 
of the 10 points outlined that represent the basis for the Caribbean Repertory Justice Program, I focus a little bit on psychological rehabilitation, said to be vital because of the impact of slavery and colonialism on the psyche and consequent behavior of people of African descent. Because for over 400 years, Africans and their descendants were classified in law as non-human, as chattel, as property and real estate. And we're thinking this week, of course, of the Zong, where our ancestors were just thrown overboard as if they were simply quote unquote cargo. They were denied recognition as members of the human family by laws derived from the parliaments and palaces of Europe and subjected to the ideology of racism that denigrated all things African. In his 1952 Black Skin White Mask, Franz Fanon analyzed the impact of colonialism and its deforming effects and argued that white colonialism imposed an existentially false and degrading existence upon its black victims to the extent that it demanded their conformity to their distorted values. So the physical brutality that was an expression of European racial ideology and which caused so much psychological trauma to Africans and their descendants populate the pages of textbooks. The punishment lists from all protest movements make for chilling reading, but are tangible reminders that our ancestors never accepted slavery and racial apartheid uncomplainingly, even if they knew they would suffer for it. And the evidence that this history has inflicted massive psychological trauma upon African descendant populations in the Caribbean in the diaspora is all around us. And Joy de Grilleri frames it within the context of what she labels post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I think that many people have been, you know, um, researching this issue of post-slave traumatic syndrome. In our region, we see skin bleaching on the rise. We see damaged self-confidence expressed through social comparison and ranking in our communities. We observe the denigration of blackness and attempts to distance ourselves from our African past. Too many of us. We maintain a ranking in our school system, graduating children who are tainted by the research, which tells them that they are in low performing schools because we have not rid ourselves of structural or indirect discrimination in education. Feelings of cultural loss and social alienation have long been expressed by our literary luminaries and by ordinary writers, especially where they have been writers in exile, voluntary or forced. The effects of racism on Caribbean people living in the diaspora have been captured in poetry and verses, as is evident in the poetry of Jamaican Una Marson, who expressed racism, experienced racism in Britain. And we feel her pain in her poems such as I am black, little brown girl, nigger, and kinky brown hair, or kinky hair blues. And I'll just read one of them, I am black, I am black. And so I must be more clever than white folk, more wise than white folk, more discreet than white folk, more courageous than white folk. And George Lamming in The Castle of My Skin speaks of colonialism, psychic entanglement that is often beyond the understanding of a third generation British citizen of West Indian ancestry, tying in with point eight of the CARICOM justice program and he goes on to say their relation to England is experienced as a racial assault that allows little space for a dialogue that would humanize the conflicts that arise from a perception of the other's uh, difference. So let me hasten to say that not all are outraged by the legacies of slavery and the racism, the racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance that affects people of African descent all over the world. And we see this in what is happening in the Black Lives Matter movement. And we see this in comments made by former prime ministers of Britain and in other diplomats, in the statements of other diplomats who pass through the region. For example, um, the former British minister with responsibility for the Caribbean, Mark Simmons, while acknowledging that slavery was abhorrent, opined. Do I think that we are in a position where we can financially offer compensation for an event two, three, four hundred years ago? No, I don't. But his statement, like all the others, 
detach the modern legacies of chattel slavery um, and redirect it uh, to traffic, modern day trafficking and human rights issues. Not that those are not important because today we're marking a, a, a particularly important day in the history of uh, modern day slavery. Britain's posture is not new. History has shown that Britain has not lived up to its responsibilities towards the Caribbean. Sir Arthur Lewis and Eric Williams have argued that Britain had an obligation to contribute to Caribbean economic development. Lewis stating in 1939 that the economic development um, of the region could not be done in isolation, but with British help. And he says, what, what claim have the West Indies to demand such sacrifices from the British people? His answer, briefly this, it is the British who by their action in past centuries are responsible for the presence in these islands of the majority of their inhabitants, whose ancestors as enslaved people contributed, contributed millions to the wealth of Great Britain, a debt which the British have yet to pay. But as Trinidadian diplomat Sir Ellis Clark said, and I let me just run quickly as I close to his quote. An administering power is not entitled to extract for centuries all that can be got out of a colony. And when that has been done to relieve itself of its obligations, justice requires that reparation be made to the country that has suffered the ravages of colonialism before that country is expected to face up to the problems and difficulties that will inevitably beset it upon independence. So will Britain own up to its moral and financial obligations? Will they do so now? History is not on our side. Are we in the Caribbean deterred by the fact that there has been no positive response from any complicit European state in terms of a financial settlement or even offer to meet and talk? That while apologies, regrets and promises have emanated from corporate entities, financial and insurance companies in the UK. There has been no outreach to the Caribbean where their wealth came from. But while universities in the UK are busy studying their connections to slavery and the transatlantic slaving business, not one has invested a penny in the Caribbean in the form of development reparation. Are we deterred by this? The answer is no. As sweet honey in the rock sings, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Varen. Uh, uh, as your speech obviously sets out so well, the British have got a lot to answer for. And our next speaker, Chris Manjapra, has been one of the, he's a very well known figure in terms of this area and writes extensively. And certainly I picked up on his work on the, from The Guardian and uh, wrote an excellent article just a few weeks ago entitled How, long, How the Long Fight for Slavery Reparations is Slowly Being Won. So I'm looking forward to some optimistic possibilities from, uh, from Chris. Uh, but uh, so I so to Chris Manjapra, he's the professor of history at Tufts University, which I think is in Boston. Is that right, Chris? Right. Boston. Yes. And he's the chair of the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism and Diaspora. Chris Manjapra. Thanks so much, Martin. And it's a real pleasure to be on this panel with uh, Breen and with Jeff as well. Uh, I want to begin by um, kind of noting where the public conversation is. And it was captured by uh, a previous prime minister of uh, Great Britain when he went to Jamaica and he said that it's time to move on. This was in 2015. It's time to move on from uh, the history of slavery. Now, that simple statement actually captures, uh, I think, uh, an atmosphere or a climate. Um, and in that sense, it's a very significant statement. It's a very commonly held one, but it's also a patently uh, inadequate and untrue one. And I wanna offer you a couple of reasons why that is clearly the case. Why can we not move on in this sense from slavery? Number one, because the experience and the history of slavery itself, racial slavery is a history of, it's a crime against humanity and it's also a history of trauma. And the very definition of trauma is that which you cannot move on from. Trauma returns. It continues to return until it is reckoned with and until that which has been wounded has been healed. Now we can 
obviously clearly understand how for African descended peoples like myself, uh, the history of racial slavery is uh, a trauma marked by repetition, uh, but also for white communities. I think it's very important to point out that white communities also suffer from the trauma. And I'll tell you what the trauma is. The trauma is the burden of living with open secrets. That is a trauma. When you know as a community that there is, there's not just water under the bridge, there is a whole ocean that has to be reckoned with. And however, there are no categories or tools to really dive into that ocean and pull out what lo lies beneath and bring it into the light, that actually creates psychic uh, unwellness, that creates social un unwellness, and that is a kind of trauma that has to be addressed, that of the open secrets. We need to stop living with open secrets. And I want to mention that just at this point in my, converse, in my remarks, because although I uh, live here in the United States, you know, I, I, I do travel to Britain a lot. In fact, I grew up in Canada, which is one of the Commonwealth nations. And so I, I understand something of the importance of uh, not speaking about certain things. And I've certainly encountered that in my own research. Uh, sometimes even British academics who I meet uh, at institutions in London or elsewhere, you know, there's a sense of not of keeping a taboo, of not wanting to probe too far or to make too many people uncomfortable because that's perhaps that's considered to be inappropriate or that would make folks uncomfortable. My plea to us is that we have to now, Britain, Britons must now get over this. And like in America, we're asking the white community to get over this in the wake of uh, the police killings of 2020 and the wake of COVID to stop living with open secrets and start speaking truth. It's really important at this stage that we all begin having a truth filled conversation. Uh, so that's you know one, one point. But then the other point that I wanna make about why we can't just move on from the history of slavery is because frankly, that history has not ended. Um, I wanna talk for a little bit about um, both the ways in which the shadow of slavery attends to everything that we see in Britain as well as in the United States. I'm talking about urban planning. I'm talking about uh, class structures. I'm talking about the accumulation of wealth, it all rests upon a foundation of centuries of uh, slave trading and plantation slavery, slavery capitalism. But I want to make another point as well uh, in what I have to say, which is that the way that slavery ended was to actually leave it unfinished. In other words, slavery, despite the narratives that we have of, quote unquote, a final abolition that came in 1838, uh, following the slave trade abolition in 1807. In the United States, we have a different narrative, the final abolition that came with the Civil War and which we could, yes, yet again, move on. In fact, when we actually look carefully, we see that in each case in which we have an abolition in the 19th century, we do not have the end of slavery, we have the evolution of slavery. We have the reconfiguration of slave-like uh, uh, processes and systems of power, and also the rights that were often attended to slave owners and to the majority white community, those rights of enrichment based upon uh, the denigration and the abuse of African descended peoples, those rights continued. They continued well beyond that time of abolition. And so we have to reckon with this fact that um, we have not yet seen the formal end to the processes of abolition. Abolitions began in the 19th century, but we have yet to see them come to their fruition. So th that's just a little uh, foreshadow of, of a couple comments that I have to make before I conclude. And when I finally conclude, I wanna talk in that mode that Martin mentioned about looking forward um, and also looking back to acknowledge the important uh, roots of reparations work in Britain itself. Britain has a very long and proud history of reparations that connects with the Caribbean and with Africa. And I wanna leave you on that note. So let me start kind of some ways back in the beginning talking about um, why it is that everything that we see carries the shadow of, of slavery. Um, just speaking in really broad br uh, brush strokes, let me just point out that um, although slavery, uh, British experience of participating in the slave trade really goes back to the 1500s, uh, we might say that when Britain became 
an imperial superpower around the 1780s and the 1790s. This is based on the, the work of Eric Williams, a great Caribbean intellectual and, and scholar uh, from Trinidad, that when we go back to the 1780s and 1790s, we see that Britain gained this superpower status precisely through its slaving economies. In other words, without slavery, Britain could never have become the world power that it, be, that, it, that it did. And that explains a lot about what happens in the 19th and the 20th centuries. In that very basic sense, slavery is at a foundation um, in, in British history. Uh, but, but furthermore, when we look maybe more concretely at how slavery uh, then transitioned uh, into the free market period from the 1840s afterwards, uh, we noticed that a number of procedures were put in place to ensure that slave owners remained the compensees and that the slaves uh, were left vulnerable. Um, the concrete research that I've done on this relates to the, the House of Rothschild, the Rothschild Bank, that uh, in 1835 provided the British government with a huge loan, 15 million pounds, at that time, that was a large portion that represented a large portion of the great uh, gross domestic product of uh, Great Britain. That amount of loan was taken out by the British government in order to then pay slave owners, uh, slave owners for the, the emancipation of their slaves because the slaves were considered property. Not only that, the enslaved had to work for a period of years in the apprenticeship that Vereen mentioned in order to, again, pay the government free labor before they were made, they were made officially nominally free. The money that was paid to slave owners went on to be reinvested into new portfolios across the Americas, including the American South to reinvest in American slavery, as well as in colonial expansion in Africa, in Austro, in Australia, in the Pacific and in South Asia. So we can trace this legacy of how slave, slavery capital continues to live and benefit the original beneficiaries. Uh, in addition, um, my research showed, this was back in 2018, as many of you now, I'm sure uh, now know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, we're, we're all a bit still stunned by this, that the amount of that bond that the government took out was so huge that the British government made you pay for it. In other words, for generations afterwards until 2018, the British government was paying back that loan uh, to, for the, the money it took out in 1835. So again, this is a story about how the tangible connection that we have to slavery is, is something that touches us all. Uh, the taxpayers of Britain are implicated in this uh, without your knowledge. Um, the buildings that we see around us, whether here in Boston or in Bristol or London or Liverpool, uh, certainly in the city of London, financial districts and other cities are very much built upon that, that capital, that wealth accumulation that comes out of slavery. Slavery is the shadow that attends to everything that we see. Um, let me move on to just sketch out for you something I, I said again earlier about uh, why it is that, that uh, the processes of abolition uh, made slavery uh, as, uh, something that evolved, um, something that was reconfigured as opposed to something that ended. Without going into great detail, and again, just a kind of bird's eye view, I'll just observe that every time there has been, there had been an abolition um, over the course of 200 years, because it was abolitions took place in waves beginning in the Americas uh, in the 1770s and the Caribbean with Haiti in the 1790s and then onwards to Britain in Britain in the 1830s, uh, France and uh, the Dutch uh, Empire in the 1840s, America in the South in the 1860s, Brazil in the 1880s. So we have a num number of cases to go by. We notice one thing that they all share in common, <laughs> which is that governments know how to pay reparations because they've done it before. It's just they've paid it the wrong way. In other words, uh, in each case that we have uh, a, a reparation that has been paid, and in each case it has been paid, it has been a perverse reparations paid to the slave owners and to their families and often uh, compensating them for decades after, generations after the end of slavery. Um, 
This, however, also points us to the fact, and Vereen mentioned this as well, that ever since the first emancip emancipations began, whether we think about uh, in New England where I'm living, uh, these original protests and petitions that were being written by, uh, by enslaved black people, by free black people, by black lawyers in Boston, uh, if, whether we think about the Haitian revolution uh, and the many peasants as well as military folk who combined uh, in order to become the French colonial regime, every time we see an abolition take place, we always see African descended communities making a, train, uh, a claim based in truth and justice that they should be given security, that there should be non-repetition for uh, the, the trauma and the violence that they experienced, and that they should receive satisfaction for what they have undergone. These are the key themes of what reparations involves. These are the key themes of restorative justice. And I think it's, it's, very, um, uh, it's, it's very sobering. Uh, and it's actually a very solemn recognition to understand that African descended people, black people have been asking for apology, for the guarantee of non-repetition, for uh, restitution, reparations, and uh, for uh, rest restoration, restorative justice from the very start, since the 1770s, decade upon decade, all the way up to where we are now. Um, and the sobering part is how difficult it seems for that open secret to be burst, so that what we all know needs to be done should actually start to happen. Okay, so uh, as we can go more into the, these long histories of, of reparations going back uh, into the past uh, in, in, in discussion if, if folks are interested. Um, but let me just uh, conclude with, with, with two points. Number one, I think it's, it's good to note that when we talk about reparations, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about not a m amount of money to be paid. We're talking about a process based and rooted in truth and justice that belongs to the community that has been affected. I think that's very important. The accusers, I'm sorry, the, the, those who have committed crimes cannot be the jurors. I think that Martin will tell me, I believe that's like a foundational uh, principle in justice. Um, but one of the found, foundational principles for restorative justice is that the community of the affected owns the process of reparations. It is those communities that must be left in charge to determine what a reparations process looks like and when satisfaction has been received. And along those lines, um, my final point here is that when we look at um, what happened, what's happened in Britain from the late 1700s, when we think, for example, of an Alauda Echiano, um, a great uh, black theorist and politician um, here in, in working in London. And we fast forward all the way to the 1990s with Bernie Grant, who I recently wrote a Guardian article featuring some of Bernie Grant's work with the African reparations uh, movement, the ARM. Uh, or we look at today's Britain, British activists and scholars, such as Esther Sanford and Kofi Clue uh, and Parco, the organization that they run on the ground in Britain. I think that there is so much for Britons to be proud of and to identify with and to seek to support um, in terms of recognizing that reparations in Britain has to be a pan-African internationalist project because the British Empire was international. Uh, so it has to involve the Caribbean, it has to involve Africa, it has to involve Black people in Britain. And, and, and just coming back to that last point, it has to be a process in which there is transparency and accountability and in which the process belongs to the community and is rooted in the work that the community, meaning the Black community, its diaspora, its location in Britain, has already been deeply invested in and has contributed to um, so richly. Uh, so, and again, something that we can talk about more in terms of this legacy of Bernie Grant uh, in, in Britain, um, starting in, in, the, in the 1980s. But I'll, I'll end there for now. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much indeed. And for anybody who wants to follow up on a number of those strands, that uh, the Guardian articles that uh, Chris was just referring to, uh, easy enough to just uh, Google and 
you get into. And I was really, I kind of knew Bernie Grant a little bit in his prime. And uh, it was really lovely to read some of the comments and the articles in terms of his involvement in the field, Chris. I really, really enjoyed reading that uh, earlier today. Um, also, the your point about the Rothschild loan uh, still gets me, even though I've heard of this story before, but it still sticks so much in the throat, the idea that we could have spent so much over so many, many decades, if not centuries, repaying the loans back to the slave owners. It's just still a massive shock. Anyway, Chris, thank you very much indeed for your opening salvo. I then turn to uh, Professor uh, Jeff Palmer. Uh, Jeff is creature of the, or part of the wind, Windrush generation. Um, as, as far as I understand it, Jeff, that you came over here back in 1955. Um, yeah. as a result of your mum having got enough money together as a seamstress over here to be able to pay your fare across. Um, and that you become, even though you are a scientist by uh, profession, that you become a major figure on the human rights side of uh, uh, looking at the issues, not least between slavery and Scotland. And uh, there was a rather nice story that I read about you um, in terms of, what has happened to you as, as being in Scotland in visiting a Lothian police headquarters in Edinburgh. Uh, it was reported to be said that a senior police officer telephoned down to reception to find out why you had not, why you were late, only to be told, no, there's no professor down here. There's just some old guy, black, an old black guy hanging around. Um, <laughs> very pleased indeed that this old black guy is hanging around here for to give us a bit of a talk. Um, this evening. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Sir Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's um, uh, an absolutely true story. And um, the, um, you, you know, um, you to, to link this history together, because it's about people. I heard the name Bernie Grant um, mentioned quite a few times towards the end of the, of the talk. Well, in 1960, um, no, 65, I was in Edinburgh and as a young man, we we're sitting in a, 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 a little restaurant together in the middle of Edinburgh. And he didn't know exactly, it's a student in my same university as myself, Harriet Watt University. And he didn't know quite what to do. And he, he wanted to, 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 he didn't want to continue his studies and I gave him five pounds and says, okay, go to London. My mom lives in Harringay and you can go and see her and let me know how you get on. That was Bernie Grant. So therefore Scotland has a link with the Caribbean, which a lot of people um, did not acknowledge. In fact, the Scots owned 30% at least of the slave plantations. Most people in the Caribbean have probably got Scottish genes like I have. I've got 3% Viking genes from Shetland. The rest of my genes are 97% African. So it is not just about the money. There is a, a legacy we cannot change. But just like history, we can't change our genes and neither can we change history. History is, you know, something which you can tell a lie about it or the truth, but you can't change what happened. And our job is to find out what happened because that is what is holding up a reparation because we have a lot of um, historical non-truth myths which very senior historians today are still peddling. And the, 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 the system, the powers that be listen to that. So if black people want to challenge, they've got to know the detail of what happened in the past. Now, in terms of my background, I'm not a historian and this has been used against me <laughs> by, um, as I said, they might as well say I was black, <laughs> but, the point is that that has been used to say he's a, a, a brewer or a scientist or a chemist. He's not a historian, so don't listen to him. So again, we now have to challenge 
uh, negative attitudes like that, or else you'll be talking in the wind because somebody is saying, what, you know, this is what happened. That's not what happened. So we have no responsibility. And therefore, I'm, uh, my background is, is, I'll just run through it a little because it also is a part of our slavery. I was born in Jamaica in 1940, a long time ago. And um, my mom had to take me to the, the capital because you couldn't earn a living in St. Elizabeth where I was born. Now my mother, his family still live on a slave plantation of one of the most significant governors of Jamaica, Earl Balcaris, who transported the Maroons um, to Nova Scotia. Now my ancestors, my mother's family still live on that estate and I'm doing work now on Balcaris. Now, how did I get into all this? As I said, my, I was born in St. Elizabeth. My mother took me to Kingston and my father, um, uh, for all sorts of reasons, left when I was about seven. Um, and that wasn't uncommon because this is a legacy of our slavery. So uh, not having a father wasn't a big deal to me. A lot of the kids didn't. Um, and when my mom left in 1951 to come to London to try and earn a living as a seamstress, um, she couldn't get a job there. So she worked at night in, you know, um, shifting mailbags, you know, for about three pounds a week. And it, she, it took her from 1951 to 1955 to save 86 pounds to bring me to London. And in the meantime, I lived with her sisters. And of course, it was about, um, I, I wasn't formally educated. I went to a church school, and but church was critical in terms of I had to go three times every Sunday. This is part of the legacy of this history. Um, and in 1955, I woke up one morning and my aunts said, you're going to London to see your mother. There's no planning. You just then pack your bags, my aunt wrapped me in newspaper, thinking it was a 24 hour trip and it was a 10 day trip. Um, when I got to New York on my own, I'd not traveled 10 miles before in my life. I was in New York and they were on a bus and the guy had a big gun to make sure that we didn't escape and they put us on a boat on the Hudson River. And I arrived at Liverpool in 1955 on my own. I had to get to London. I had no idea where London was, I had to ask. I got to London, saw my mother for the first time since 1951. I didn't recognize her, she recognized me. And we went home, we had one room in an attic and the next morning she woke me up. She was taking me to work. I didn't know I was coming here to go to work. Um, and fortunate for me, but unfortunate for her, because she wanted her 86 pounds back. And we always joked about it until she passed away. Whenever I did do something she wanted, she always says, I want my 86 pound back. That's not redeemable. <laughs> However, the next morning we got to the door in the middle of London, next to Pentonville prison, where they hanged people. That's where we lived. Um, we got to the door about half past seven after I just traveled 5,000 miles the day before, arrived after a 5,000 mile trip. And when we got to the door, there was a man there. And that man said, I couldn't go to work because I was one month short of my 15th birthday. I had to go to school. The school kept me for about well, six months, fortunately, but that was my second school. The first school my mom took me to, which was nearer the house, I was designated educationally subnormal, ESN. I was given a test and I was dedicated, de you know, designated educationally subnormal. A lot of black kids in London then at that time were designated educationally subnormal. The point is that parents who try to um, uh, inquire about the poor education of their children were described as having unrealistic expectations. Now, where does that come from? That come from 1753. 
when David Hume said, Negroes are inferior to white people. That's what killed George Floyd. <laughs> That's what in fact has limited black people. That one statement that Negroes are inferior in this view. Now that's the great mind Hume. Thus we have a problem because Edinburgh University has just taken down his name from one of the buildings, the Hume Tower, and some of the most powerful historians in the country and other people of power are saying they want it back up because Hume was a great mind. What he said about black slavery was he had an off day. That off day has killed thousands of black people. That off day makes people see you, no matter who you are as black, and see you as inferior. In fact, when Hume was told that some black people had talents and ability, he said they were parrots. Therefore, they were imitating. It wasn't inherent. So our history, has all those little points in it, which the ordinary guy on the street knows. This aspect of inferiority. So when that policeman had his knee on Floyd's neck, he had his hands in his pocket. That was David Hume. The point is that when Hume said that in 1753, later on, Kant picked it up and can turn it into race. And therefore we now have two concepts of inferiority, race and, um, uh, you know, difference in terms of intellect that we are now dealing with today. And the fact is that racism, as far as I'm concerned, as a, as a concept came out of slavery, that inferiority, that, inability to be consistent, to do this, to do that. That's where it comes from. In fact, Hume and Kant were used to justify the enslavement of black people, those concepts, inferiority and race. And it's how do we deal with those? Because in the minds of, you know, children, I was in the north of Scotland a few years ago and I said to seven year old kids, have you ever heard the N word? and 90% of the hands came up, they were like seven years of age. The teachers were horrified. The point is that, how have I tried to deal with that? Now, in, in, in Edinburgh, we have one of the most iconic statues relating to slavery in the world. Now, if I say to you, you've heard of William Wilberforce, you will probably say yes. If I said, have you heard of Henry Dundas? And if you don't say yes immediately, then you know nothing about William Wilberforce. <laughs> because Henry Dundas in 1792, put down an amendment for Wilberforce's bill for immediate abolition of the slave trade. Henry Dundas put down an amendment. This is the time of Pitt, William Pitt, the great prime minister, Fox, Burke, they were all there at this time. And Dundas got gradual abolition carried because what it was about, he was saying, gradual, well, Pitt in his speech, I've got the lotus behind me on the wall, I've got it up and Pitt said, gradual meant refusing to act until a thousand favorable circumstances unite. That's the prime minister saying that in 1792. It meant never, but that was passed and that lasted from 1792 to 1807. And it, it was passed in 1807 because Henry Dundas was impeached in 1806. And we've worked it out just recently. He actually took 15 million of money from the Royal Navy during that period when he was gradually abolishing slavery. So he was a crook. During that period, he selected the governor for Jamaica, Lord Bar Earl Balcarras, 
you know, in 1794, and Balcaras transported 500 Mar Maroons, who he felt was interfering with slavery, to Nova Scotia. Balcaras bought slaves to fight for Dundas in San Domingo, Haiti, where he lost 40,000 British troops, destroyed Haiti. And the fact is that nobody knows about that. <laughs> the point is that I have then lobbied the Edinburgh Council. They set up a committee over three years ago because my view was the narrative on that plaque must be changed. It doesn't mention slavery. It's been there for 199 years. And therefore, my attitude to statues, I don't want them down. We took two down in Bristol. What was the result? Nothing. The fact is that that's a diversion. The point is, my view is, the next statue that come down should be racism, because that is the consequence of slavery. And what I tend to say is, we cannot change the past, but we can change the consequences of the past, such as racism, for the better. The point is that one of the greatest obstacles, obstacles to anything we want to do, and with the study with Henry Dundas, three years on the council, it was disbanded the committee because the, the descendant of Henry Dundas and a historian, stopping myself and another colleague all the time, whatever we said. And the point is that what I've discovered is one point which is used to negate our claims is there were slaves in Britain there were slaves in Africa, the Arabs had slaves. The point is that a most famous legal case in Scotland where Henry Dundas was involved called the Joseph Knight case. That case is used to say Scotland abolished slavery in 1778. My view is that from the studies I've done, Joseph Knight was not a slave, he was a servant. So how could you abolish slavery with a servant? Also to win that case, Henry Dundas said, there are no slaves in Britain and cannot be from his constitution. That's in the same article where the historian says Dundas helped Joseph Knight. They never said that Dundas said, there are no slaves in Britain and cannot be. And he also said though at the same time, which has never been reported, Knight was free in, in Britain or in Scotland, but he was a slave in the Caribbean. That was reaffirming the legality of slavery in the Caribbean. So that case has to be looked at because a lot of Scottish people and British people, I even got black people who studied, have actually quoted that case to say, Scotland abolished slavery. So therefore it balances in some way the fact that they own 30% of the slave plantations. It is that balance that Professor Bigger at Oxford wrote an article just a couple of days ago to say, it's a balance. We built you roads, we built you that, we taught you English, you know, um, you know and therefore that balances. So finally, the point is that we have to address the negative aspects which stops people acting. And for that, we have to know our history. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. The uh, resonance in terms of what you say, I think is very strong. And uh, I must say, very interested in what you've said about the Scottish involvement in the slave era, um, not least being that your own blood is tied into the Scottish side as well. So very, very interesting. Right, we've, we're now going to move on to uh, questions. Uh, whilst people are sending their questions in, uh, just one question that I just wanted to perhaps start off with, with Varen, and it ties into um, Chris's article, um, where the title was, How the Long Fight for Slavery Reparations is Slowly Being Won. And I wonder whether you, uh, being so involved with the CARICOM um, venture, uh, whether you felt that that was right, whether you felt that the, whether we, they're making some significant gains and progress is being made 
in relation to the prospects of reparations? Um, thank you. I absolutely agree with Chris. The thing is, we're not going to have an overnight resolution to this issue. And I always go back to the process of emancipation, the process of abolishing, ab abolishing the, tra the trafficking in enslaved Africans and, and bringing change across the centuries. Progress is being made, but we have to keep up the struggle. We can't rest and say, well, people are saying they're sorry, companies are saying me too, we have to keep going. But I don't think two years ago we would think that would be here at this point. Um, so he's right, but the, the, the battle has not yet been won. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take some questions from the, from the audience. Uh, I've got Glenna Lynch here to the whole panel. She says, why do you think the British government is so reluctant to compensate the descendants of slaves when it was previously so quick to compensate the slave owners? Chris, do you want to start with that one? Uh, yes, sure. Um, well, I, I'll, it's a great observation. Um, it is the case that uh, the British government is deeply implicated. Uh, we know uh, that both in terms of um, folks in the legislature at the time of slavery who were slave owners. We know that the royal family was deeply invested in slavery. We know that the Church of England was deeply in rest, invested in slavery. So maybe this is the story of how those who are in power uh, are, are fearful of uh, the challenge to their status or to their wealth uh, or to their um, control over the historical narrative that uh, is, is signified by, by asking for the truth. So I think it has to do with that. I think we're, we, we're, it's, it's a familiar phenomenon of the powerful, the elites wanting to control the narrative. And I, I wanna give you one concrete example. It's not from the government, but it is from, the, from business because you know, business enterprises were very much working very closely with the British government um, throughout this period. And so when I have, you know, 2018, I find all of these uh, records about the Rothschilds uh, involvement with the British government. Uh, I have been writing to the Rothschilds Bank um, regularly since 2019 to uh, at least ask them, would they first verify that this is the case? Uh, then would they comment on this history? And would they consider making some statement about what it means to them or what they are willing to do to repair for this, uh, for their involvement and for this history, to which I've received silence. And so I just think that's very powerful. Um, the, the ability of, the, of those in power to maintain the narrative while also pr not providing uh, accountability, transparent information to those who are asking questions is a way to keep the narrative the same. So I just really hope that one concrete thing that we can start observe seeing taking place in Britain will be some kind of commission of truth and justice, some kind of inquiry to get answers that we need because this narrative can no longer be controlled. It's no longer in the bag uh, for those in power. I think it's, I think we're beyond that point now. Thank you very much, Chris, for that. Uh, I've got uh, Josh Castellino, who's the head of the Minority Rights Group, who's said he would like to ask a question Josh, you able to come forth? Yeah, with the wonders of modern science. We can, looks like you're there. Joshua. Hi, thank you very much, Martin. And fascinating, fascinating session. Uh, thank you very much for the, those insights, uh, Varian, Chris, and, and Jeff. I think they are intriguing. But I, I mean, in a sense, uh, Varian, the, the idea that somehow this, uh, these reparations should be in the form of development funding just really great because this is development funding is really supposed to be in addition. It's not about correcting the past, it's about promoting the current and the future. And I think we need to have them parallel, just to pursue them both in parallel. And this is not, one cannot be, I hope can't be the, the alternative to the other because that's the easy way of getting the states in the OECD who benefited and built their wealth so much on this exploitation to continue to do so. Uh, Chris, I loved what you said about the trauma and of course the oceans, those oceans you talked about are now thanks to Samuel Jackson and Afwa Hirsch, we know, are literally littered with 
with dead bodies. And I think the idea of naming the Rothschilds, but also Goldman Sachs and the finance and insurance industries are a really intriguing way to go forward. And I thought, Jeff, the one name that I thought was was missing from that rich historical narrative, of course, um, John Maynard Keynes, who, who decided that the, the Europe was full of, that Europe was crowded and that somehow all these other areas in the world were unpeopled because the people who were living on them were lazy and weren't exploiting them to their fullest. And therefore it justified European engagement in all of these areas. Key point for climate change today, because that's what starts off the whole over exploitation, the destruction of circular economies, and of course the slave trade. But I guess, Martin, the question really is whether or not that reparations debate that we have been having, which is very conveniently kept at an arm's length by, by a combination of denial, lying, and legal, legal subterfuge, like questions around, oh, but that was a long time ago, that's the wrong people, How, which jurisdiction will we go in? I just wonder whether the way to tackle this is really to go after those hallowed names, the 150-year corporations, who very proud <coughs> tell us about their 150 years, who are behind those gleaming buildings in London and Liverpool and Bristol that, that Chris, you referred to. Is there a, not a more direct approach to the corporations? I mean, Lee, they have done incredible work on holding, holding these kinds of uh, institutions to account. Maybe going after the state is perhaps the wrong route and maybe going after the corporations is a better route. And also not on the basis of, oh, that was then. We need to prove this is a continuing tort. This is a continuing damage being done, both to the people who are, who are offspring, so both to the descendants, but also to others within, these, within our societies today who are reaping, in a sense, the damage done by all of the corporations' continued attempt to, to lie and obfuscate their way and also tell history in the way that they choose to tell it. Thank you. Joshua, thank you very much indeed. Some very good points. Jeff, any responses to that? Yes, I think, um, you know, having dealt with the system at the, all different levels, the point is, if you look at the compensation document, it actually says that the slave owners were entitled by law to the compensation. The point is, therefore, you've got to dismantle that because that you're talking about a legal issue. So we can beat our gums up about anything. Somebody will say they were legally entitled. I'm not saying they were, but that is something we have to consider. The other thing we have to consider is we can say what we like again. We have the most senior historians saying at Oxford and in Edinburgh saying, the fact is that there is a balance. There is also, there was slavery here. So what you're complaining about? And therefore, this may seem trivial, but that is what is stopping governments moving. And we then have to challenge it historically and also, in fact, morally. And therefore, it is no but just saying, get a big company to pay us some money. It won't happen. We have to challenge. It took me four years to get Henry Dundas's statue plaque changed. And there's still opposition to that. Tom Devine, the senior historian says, call the Edinburgh Council a kangaroo court in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago. So we still have that battle to fight, to change minds and attitudes. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I've got quite a lot of questions coming up. So I'm gonna take a few more. Veronica Herbert. I've got, I've got Veronica's question here, so I'm going to just okay. put it to the panel. Um, Veronica says, do you think there is scope for lobbying the IMF and the World Bank to cancel the debts of member countries that were impacted by slavery? And would that be an appropriate step for obtaining justice for slavery? Varen, you got a view about that? Um, well, just simply to say that that is the the point 10 of the CARICOM reparation 10 point action plan, debt cancellation. And um, that is what, that's part of what we're pursuing. But Martin, if you'll allow me, I, I really have to comment on the previous set of comments and questions um, yeah, because, because it's not either or, it's not either go after the companies or go after the church or go after the state. I think we have to do all of the above because the state provided this 
threshold under which these other entities were able to participate in the transatlantic trafficking and enslaved Africans and plantation slavery. So we have to go after everyone. And the second thing is that it's not either cash or a development package. The fact is that it's gonna take a, a, a sit down to work out what cash will be necessary to make a proper development package. And the, the, the fact that we're talking development is quite in order because at the moment of independence, when Caribbean leaders went to the UK to negotiate how they were going to manage on their own at, at independence, starting with Jamaica, then Trinidad and Tobago. They asked for a development package and they were turned away. And yet at the same time from what research is, is now showing, and Professor Beckles has been talking about this, Asian countries got a development package, something called the Colombo Plan. So when you're asking the question, why is the UK reluctant to pay? Look at why they paid other groups. People are reluctant to admit that there's racism in this. There is racism. There's also not enough will or support by people of African descent around the world. We have to step up our support and campaign for this. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's also going on intimidation, um, certainly uh, we have to talk about why governments are not stepping forward with greater alacrity. So it's a combination of issues. And finally, I will say this, if we continue not to have history as a mandatory subject in our schools, I don't know about the UK, but certainly in the Caribbean, it's not a compulsory subject. Very few people are learning history. And maybe the hope is that in time, the knowledge will disappear. And therefore we are back to square one in terms of um, support for a knowledge of the justification for reparation. So we have a lot of work to do and we have to operate on all fronts in order to have a ground swell because governments now believe that, well, you know, there's nothing at stake. We don't have anybody saying that we're not voting for you or putting you in power if you don't talk reparation. You know, we have to ensure as the affected people that it is not something that can be ignored. Thanks, Bren. I can assure you the history of the slave trade is not a part of the British curriculum for history, very sadly. Maybe one day that will change, but certainly not in the foreseeable future. Um, I've got a large- Sorry, Martin, but in 2007, during this hullabaloo about the bicentennial, there was this um, discussion about having curriculum change and ensuring that that was taught. Now, it wasn't such a happy thing because you cannot teach children that their history started with, with enslavement. When you do that, you make them ashamed. It has to be part of a wide history program. So that would be something, but it's not the total thing that should be done in terms of curriculum change. Okay, thanks, Ren. I've got Elijah Douglas Smith, um, who's asked to raise a question with the panel. Elijah, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know if you can no. see me. <laughs> um, can you see me now? And we can see you as well, good, perfect. Yeah. So um, just, uh, a bit about myself and um, why I joined this panel and why I wanted to speak on this. Um, so I currently work at Google. I'm 24, um, British Caribbean descent within the UK. I can just, just confirm that we don't get talks about slavery within the British education system at all. I um, did start a petition to have the start the conversation of slavery reparations within the UK. We got 20,000 signatures. Um, and we got a response at 10,000 signatures from the government, basically saying to sum up, while reparations are not part of the government's approach, we feel deep sorrow for the transatlantic slave trade and fully recognize the strong sense of injustice and the legacy of slavery in the most effective parts of the world. We also believe that we have much to do today in the future to address the reality of slavery in the UK and around the world. So basically they responded saying, we, we, we understand what we did, we, we know it has happened. We are not interested 
to have those discussions regarding reparations for the um, for the colonies for the, basically the, the old empire. So when I um, when I was reached out to have this conversation with you guys on the panel, I, I wanted to discuss most importantly the factors of what reparations potentially looks like. So it to me as a young person within um, it, within Britain and having conversations with within people from the community, there is support for it. The notion that there needs to be there needs to be some sort of reparations in terms of for the, for the Caribbean, for Africa, for all the places around the world where Britain has effectively robbed from those nations. And also, there is a look to to have an understanding of how do you support the diaspora within Britain. So, for example, looking at um, you know, the um, Windrush, Windrush um, scandal, looking at all the scandals within Black people within the UK itself. And I, I believe personally, when I started this petition, when I've had discussions with the newspaper, the media, and then there were comments from the public, it's simply a case of, we don't believe that because it's happened so far in the past that we are still responsible for the actions. And you need, to, the thing that comes back to me is, okay, I, I'm a young person within the UK. I'm passionate enough about this to campaign about it, but there's no active change. And I'm speaking on in terms of economic empowerment. It won't change. I work within one of the 1% of the tech companies in the world. And my day-to-day -day interactions are simply a, a sea of white people. And there is no, it, there are, there's, there's no person or people, groups of people that look like me in these companies. And again, we can get this reparations. We can get, whether it's a pay, uh, payment, whether it's economic empowerment, whether it's a case of a development plan, which you mentioned today, which I think is a brilliant idea we will still be in the same places within the communities, within these nations that we res reside in. So even if we get a reparations, uh, if it's a payment, whether it's a change in education, we, again, we are probably the most educated people within the country itself uh, from the African descent. It won't change the future in terms of my outlook in the future. It, it, racism is getting better within the UK, but it's still there. My grandparents faced it when they came from the Caribbean to build a better life here. They were stopped getting jobs. They were stopped getting education. They stopped every sort of step to develop. They were being stopped. And I'm passionate about this because again, slavery reparations shouldn't be seen as just a one-stop uh, trick pony. It should be a generational sort of outlook on it Agreed. so whether it's empowerment for the businesses to ensure that we can build a black no. business or an economy so we can support ourselves because again when you look at businesses and companies when uh, it is set up you generally hire people that look like you or come from the same communities as you which is why no. when i look at my video calls now from working from home i'm the only black face that i see in in the the screen that i'm working mm -hmm. from there's a case of not just looking at reparations, it's looking at the whole spectrum of it, whether it might be a taxation, remove taxation for generations of black people so that we can build our wealth because from the British public, the notion is, and it's very simple, you don't deserve it, it's going to be a handout. Okay then, if you if that's the notion- Elijah, Elijah, I'm going to stop you just because you, the notion your passion totally shows through. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> take my hat off here for the petition that you put together, that was, Absolutely amazing. So uh, just to give the opportunity of the panel to respond to some of the points you've been making, which absolutely uh, shines through from what you say. Chris, you got Yeah, I, will, I really wanted to respond to what you said, Elijah. I had brilliant points. And to me, I would encapsulate uh, so much of your insight into the term policy change. Uh, so we've talked about the need for development. We've talked about cash uh, reparations. And I think there's this whole other uh, umbrella of transformation of, of policy within nation states. And, you know, that ref relates to educational policy, housing policy, food systems, punishment, policing, judiciaries, um, you know, the, the inequality that is so obvious in the British nation. When you look at academia, I mean, what George is, Jeff is talking about, sorry, Jeff, in terms of these, you know, white professors who are trying to own the history um, yes. is only going to happen because 
of graduate students in Britain are coming from African descendant communities. So I mean, that's a problem. That's a, such an extreme problem. And it speaks to uh, why policy change has to be part of the reparations discussion. So if there's one takeaway for me, and it's coming out of you know having had a lot of conversations with reparationists now over the past many years, reparations takes place at many different scales. And like Farin was saying, it is all of the above. And it's it, everything has to be on the table. And fundamentally for me, it has, has to be a process owned by the community. Black communities have to be able to decide what all is entailed in that term repair. And it certainly has to be much more than a check, <laughs> right? I mean, given yeah. that we're talking about policies that, are, that really are infused with racism uh, that, that really have to be addressed. Jeff, did you want to say, say something about I mean, yeah, I, I, I think the young man was 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 talking about what I say we have to remove. The point is that people will not move to what you want, no matter what your list is, if they have racist, systemic racist views, which are being supported by senior academics. Now, what I'm trying to say, where are the black academics challenging that? Where are the black historians challenging bigger? at Oxford or at Sir Tom Devine in Edinburgh. Because if you don't challenge those, so it's left to a brewer, somebody who is not a historian. I'm challenging them. And therefore we must address that issue of where the people with the power, academics, are managing all changes. And the one word we should, I think, leave here today, we're talking about consequences consequences because if you don't use that word people say it's the past forget it it is consequences okay thank you very much for that jeff Martin, can, I, can i just mention that i, I again just watching from the outside i want to just mention how inspired i am by what the green party has done they have a platform now where they have been asking in britain for uh for the consequences to be addressed and why is there not more discussion in Parliament? Why has the, rep the word reparations only been mentioned in the House of Lords back in 1996? And yes, recently, 2019, some very vocal uh, members of Parliament, one in particular, used the term. But when do we get to hear this language being spoken from the House of Parliament in Britain? Won't that make a difference too? Uh, why has it not happened more? How can, it, how can we insist that that be the case? Challenge those historians. Yeah, yeah. Challenge the, the, the concepts of slavery everywhere. So why are you complaining? All right, I'm going to bring in a couple more questions and then bring in Beren uh, after the questions. Uh, Seymour Stewart. Seymour, are you around and able to join us? Oh, we're not seeing anything. Oh, yes. Seymour, you're on mute and in a car. <laughs> I had to stop on my way to work to, to listen to the seminar. I've enjoyed all of the speakers um, so far. And um, I, I just want to add this. The, the European Union has a list of 27 countries that it has blacklisted for so-called non-cooperation and harmful tax practices and so on and so forth. All of those 27 countries have one thing in common. They're all former colonies of European countries. Now, that exacerbates the problem that we face in seeking reparation. And what they are saying that these 27 countries do are practices that go on in Europe every day. Whether right or wrong, I make no comment, but that double standard and I wonder how you might tie this in to the call for reparation. If, if they can't give us reparation for things that have gone on 200 years ago, I mean, I'm sorry, if, if they can't deal with what's going on now no. <laughs> and taking their feet off, their, uh, off our necks, how do we think they're going to give us reparation for things that went on 200 years ago? When they're going to say that it's not my generation, that was a long, long time ago. It's a real uphill task. I really do enjoy the, I really do think of the, 
the speaker who said, maybe we should sue the companies. I, I know, Professor Palmer, you don't think it's a good idea, but maybe we should sue the companies as a yeah, country. I agree. I'm not saying it's a good idea. You've got to get rid of what stops you doing that and succeeding. Sorry, Jeff, you're saying it is a good idea or it's just not yeah, a good Yeah, I'm idea? saying, yeah, you can, you can, we can do anything we want about reparation. But what I'm saying is that what are the factors that are limiting us doing it and succeeding? That's my point. That we must address that. We can't ask for them to do it by free will. They won't. Seymour seems to have disappeared off into his car. <laughs> Ren, <laughs> thoughts on that? Um, thank you. But can I just ask, crave your indulgence to ask if there's any way that we, uh, Elijah Douglas Smith could share his details off screen um, with us. I would really like to have a conversation with him. So if maybe your technical people, Martin, can help me with that. Um, I'm sure, yeah. One. So listen, I, I keep hearing about this theory of distant. There's a theory of distance stroke distant and it comes up all the time when we are addressing the issue of of justice it is this theory is not used for other groups that have been paid reparation and who continue to be paid reparation but it's always used when we as people of african descent are an african people i agree mm -hmm. about it. yes and, and i think that we we need to stop this because um and, and then on a day like today, what's happening is that there's a deflection of the EU from the transatlantic trafficking and the historic wrong that was done onto modern day slavery. Now, modern day slavery is absolutely wrong, but there's a connection between the two. And I think that we should make the connection and talk about both and not just use one day to say, well, we're only focusing on that and we don't want to talk about the other thing. In Jamaica, each time diplomats from the UK are making statements, when they're asked about reparation for historic wrongs, they say, well, that's long ago. Um, the idea that we're going to pay for dead people, that's not on. <coughs> However, we have our modern day slavery and this is what is happening. So I think we need to be um, conscious that that is part of, the, of what is going on to deflect the attention from, from what we are talking about. You're absolutely right, the person who talked about racism. Racism, anti-Black racism is escalating. COVID-19 is unmasking that. And so we really have to redouble the fight. The Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has just adopted a general recommendation 36 on racial profiling by law enforcement officials, because this again is something that especially young black men are, are facing. So there is some work going on in terms of addressing the issue of, of anti-black racism, but we have to step up the, the, the fight against that. In terms of legacies, what is happening now and the, the, this issue about EU countries and, and what they're doing to former colonies, so it's not just the historic issues that we're talking about. We're talking about continuing harm. So the reparation movement is also about continuing harm. And Chris is right when he drew our attention to the 2015 loan repayment and what it took for that and the ever present nature of that history in our consciousness. But let me say that those who say it was too long ago and present generations are not culpable should remember the kind of society in which you're living now. You need, you need to look at the development that has taken place in Europe and you have to look at the counterpoint, the underdevelopment that has gone on in this region, in the Caribbean, the Americas, Latin America, Africa. The two are connected. You can't have it both ways. You can't continue to benefit, it, benefit from the riches of the past and yet say, I have no responsibility um, for the present. So that's how I would address that. Part of the consequence of the past is racism. Yes. And therefore that 
we is to me that's the most significant consequence. Yes, and that's the, that's the, <laughs> yeah. that's you are talking about toppling that monument, but it that's is. But I want down. And you are right, but I'm also saying the economic <coughs> wealth that, that that was extracted. Yeah, yeah. we Africa. need money to do it. I agree. Yes, so you can't say you're benefiting because of the intergenerational transmission of wealth. And we have the intergenerational transmission of poverty. Mm -hmm. so I agree. In the past, and there's no connection between the two. That's why I would you word consequence. Yeah. And forget yeah, about the got, terms. So I've got three uh, contributions, part questions, part observations. So I'll just put the three out there and then take each of you to perhaps respond. Uh, first is an observation from Wangui Kimoto saying part of the pushback for slavery and colonialism reparations is that the issues were not even defined as human rights issues then. Second is from Natasha Thompson. What work is happening right now that people can support and get involved with? How can we help you to keep up the struggle? And then the final is from Yonitz Percival, who says, how do you explain the fact that reparations were paid for the Jewish Holocaust compared with the resistance to pay reparations for the Holocaust of slavery? So three separate points. Chris, you pick out whichever you fancy responding to. Thank you. Um, I'll just kind of summarize uh, those questions in my mind and, and give a, a brief uh, kind of comment to end, which is that, you know, the, the reality is that anti-Black racism and white supremacy are uh, forces of our present just as much as they are forces of the past. There is this legacy um, of uh, wealth being accumulated uh, for majority white societies and majority white families by disproportionately um, harming black communities. It's a relationship. Uh, and we have to accept that relationship, not as something of the past, but as a defining characteristic of now. And we have to do what Black Lives Matter is asking in their five point plan, stop, the harm. So recognize the harm, stop the harm, and then remedy the harm. That's the mode we, we are in. We all need to have that kind of reparative consciousness um, now, uh, as opposed to where I think we have been for so long. And I'm so grateful that we're finally getting beyond this point of the discussion around, oh, but it was long ago. That is a ruse. That is an alibi. That is colonial power and racism verbalized. Um, and, you know, just getting to this point of like how what's being written and what historians are saying relates to how policy is going to change and how truth is going to come out. You know, it's clear that one of the ways that power works is by trying to uh, own the narrative, own the story, and also own the secrets. Uh, and that really can, can work for a certain period of time, but it will not work if there is groundswell of mobilization, if there is grassroots activism, if there are people within institutions who have the courage to say, no, not again, not this time. And if those people then find each other in coalition and in formation, and you know, it's happened before, I'm gonna go back to the Bernie Grant moment that he was a coalition builder. He worked with Chief Abiola, in Nigeria, with Black communities in Britain, with African-American communities through Encobra and uh, also Caribbean communities. And, and like many others before him, he formed a coalitional international project to demand truth. We have new possibilities. We are in a new moment and we will do that again now. And who knows where it might get us because you know some of these lies, they have a shelf life. I mean, how, how long are we going to allow it was long ago and now, and this is different. How long are we gonna allow that to last? Especially when we can all see before our eyes that the past lives, that the, you know, what my family has experienced in terms of police brutality, in, in terms of my uncle, that that's not something that, you know, uh, people who I went to school with or people who I work with who are white experience. My reality is distinctive because of race. We know this, this is, this is not a secret. Now we need to do something about it. And, and I think we, we are, I think we are. I'm very hopeful that um, we're in this new moment and new things are possible. Just to chip in another question that was raised by somebody from our team, Hugh Thompson Gilbert says, can there be restorative justice without financial reparations? 
uh, seems to me quite a critical question. Jeff, your view on that? Well, I will just um, answer one of the other points, and I'll come to that, in, yeah. in terms of the rights of man, that people are on this misguided belief that the people who ran slavery didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> there were some of the brightest people. <laughs> they knew exactly what they were doing. As I say to somebody, we might as well say, you know, the people from the past, we are living by the, the values of the past, whether it's in religion or non-religion. So they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew they were violating the rights of people. So let's forget that. The other point is, you know, why the Jewish people got reparation, we didn't. The point is that, I don't know, I'm not a politician, but I'm, I'm glad the, the, the discussion is now coming around to consequences, one word. Because if you spend 15 hours Describing all that when one word will do, then the system doesn't listen. And therefore, we've got to get our historians, our politicians, um, whoever, to challenge the concepts that stops us getting people to do what we want, asking them it won't happen. And, and therefore, finally, you know, I just feel that in terms of reparation to say well, whatever, everything needs money to be done. And therefore, if we want to change some of the terrible social conditions and injustice that black people suffer today who are descendants of this slavery, then the fact is it needs money. But we've got to convince the system that in fact that is right. <clears throat> and what I've experienced is the system in terms of academics and the powers that be are, are, have excuses to say, they don't need to pay anything. And that's what we've got to challenge. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I think there's a question here to, uh, that, uh, another question, but I think to put it to Varen in her role on the CARICOM uh, committee. Um, and that's a chap called Clyde Baldwin, who's based here in the UK, is it from Human Rights Watch. <coughs> Clive says, what would it take to get the British government and institutions to fully and finally accept responsibility when even in the Kenya Mau Mau case, after paying out damages and paying for a memorial, they still continue to fight new claims from survivors of the torture and deny justice. So what do you think needs to be done to get the British to, at long last, take their responsibilities, Varen? I, I can't tell you what will make Britain live up to its responsibility. Britain knows exactly what it has to do. The fact that it won't is that we're not pushing them enough to do it. And therefore we need all hands on deck. Somebody asked a question about what they can do. I say form reparation lobby groups, wherever you are. And also um, you can write to the, if you want to help us here in the Caribbean, you can write to reparation.research at uwimona. Dot edu dot jm. I was looking to see how I could do it in the chat, but apparently I can't. Uh, so I, I hope that gets out there. And I, I don't know why people are so reluctant to say that we who are claiming reparation um, require money in order to improve our conditions. Without economic empowerment, people don't even take it seriously. So you need to be restored to a situation where you can be uh, competitive on the, on the global scale. Um, the fact is that we have been plunged into poverty because of the actions of the past. Somebody did this, they know who they are and they know what they're supposed to do. It's just that we need more grassroots activism. Without grassroots people, you know, this is not going to work. Um, Historians and academics, we are doing our part. We are unearthing the information. We are feeding that to our people. But history has shown grassroots activism is going to be critical, boots on the ground in terms of spreading the word. And we're not going to fight like Sam Sharp and Chief Techi and Busa and so on in this, in this era. But we have to use other strategies in order to force people to the table. You talk about um, truth and reconciliation and so on, and cashless uh, reparation. 
we, we have seen what's happening in South Africa. We have seen the discussions and the criticisms about the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission, which did not go the other, um, the further step uh, to reparation. So I don't think that's what, we want the Truth and Reconciliation, but we also want that to be accompanied by repair. And so we must not run away from what has to be done. We just need to build a, a coalition, as Chris was saying, and I think we, we just need more people on, on, on board. There are some people, including some of our own um, African people, meaning global, global Africa, that they, I don't know, I always say that in my own space, they think they maybe came on the Queen Mary or the British Airways or something, and not on the Zong and the Jesus and these, and these middle passage slavers. We came from there. And therefore, even if you're doing better than other people, you need, we need your support. We need your energy. We need you to convince those who are in the corridors of power to do the right thing. But change does not come overnight. We have seen that with emancipation. We just have to continue and not give up the struggle. I, I had ended my first intervention with sweet honey on the rock. Okay, and I, I, I repeat that. Okay, so we have to keep on until freedom comes. Martin, could I follow up on what- um, Yeah, Marie of course, yeah, do. Um, so I, I, I agree fully with what Verena is saying, and I feel like what it is to find the formation, the coalition, the grassroots community, what, what's, why do that? Partly it's because it is within that community, those communities, that we can talk about what we need to discuss. We can speak truth because so many of the institutions that we are in, I'm speaking as an academic, are actually formed in order to ensure that the open secrets remain. I'll give you one concrete example. When I um, uncovered this fact about um, the, the long bond payment um, that the British government had taken out from the bank that I just mentioned, the first thing I did is I went to speak to some British academics, folks who I thought were colleagues. And one of those very well-placed British historians said, if you go public with this, you know, paraphrasing, we will destroy you. But it was basically a threat against my reputation, against my place in the, in, 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 in the profession. It was a very, very clear threat that don't cross me or, or speak about this taboo. And I think those taboos are there to maintain systems of power. That's what we're up against. That's fine. We can recognize it, but we can't allow that to cow us or to make us fearful. We have to respond to that by working in coalition. So one of the first things I did once I left, certainly stunned by this unexpected attack from a British historian, was I went and I found colleagues in Jamaica. I went and I spoke to Vereen. I spoke to Hillary Beckles. I, and through that formation, I realized in strength, I mean, in, in, in numbers, we have strength. Um, and one more example I'll give you of this from the American case. When you look at how reparations, the movement is taking place here right now, it's working at many different levels. So you have the HR 40 bill in government being led by, uh, by one of the uh, Congress members. You have uh, ENCOBRA and NARC, which are civic organizations organizing on a national scale. Then you have in cities like in Evanston or in Los Angeles, you have local groups that are working within uh, the, the city council in order to pass reparations um, laws. And then you have most recently, a couple of days ago, Black Lives Matter put out a big document saying, how do we start uh, reparations activities just on the grassroots, in our community, in our neighborhood? What does that look like? It's all of these. And it's about doing this kind of work and then connecting with others who are also doing this work because this is not exclusive work. Um, this is work in which we actually need each other because it's only in that formation that we can speak truth and talk about what uh, has to be said given that there is so much pressure to uh, maintain the unsayable, to police the unsayable, because it's when that happens, that policing is successful, that this fiction that we're in, that things from long ago are long ago, and now we're all, you know, that fiction can only hold if we live with open secrets. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I just want to kind of make this plea 
that we do the work of reparations locally, but also connect at different scales, nationally, internationally, um, and, uh, and, and that's what's going to change uh, things, I think, this time. And I think Chris is right. When we have a joined up movement on all continents, when all Africa comes on board, when African people in the EU, in the UK, in Latin America, and joining with the Caribbean, when we become a force, then I don't think we'll be able to be ignored. And thankfully, Chris, um, I was happy that you reached out to us in the Caribbean because the University of the West Indies is an activist university. It was established to clean up the colonial mess. And we have been trying to do that ever since through history education and other kinds of research. So we are, we welcome, we welcomed you and we were happy. We're happy to be still working with you in the Center for Reparation Research um, because this is going to be a long battle but we have to commit to it. And, and our grassroots people know because they are the ones who are living sometimes with the oppression. And they know that it's coming back from, it's coming from slavery. People who are better off might think, well, this has nothing to do with me. So that's why we need to reach out in, in the way of Walter Rodney, in a conscientizing through groundings in the communities. And, and I think that is what we're doing. Thank you both very much. I've got one other comment. This is from Malika Robinson. And she says, I'm rather disgusted to find that taxpayers such as myself and my 100 year old mother from Jamaica have ended up paying taxes towards the compensation that was paid to slave owners. <laughs> oh, that was rather a lovely comment. Right. Uh, quite uh, right a lot too. of us paid, a lot of us helped to pay, us paid for it in the, in the 50s um, until yeah. now. So to me, to say the British people were paying it, it's just a whole load of nonsense. But you know, what, what I'm saying is that there's an article now in The Spectator by Professor Bigger from Oxford trying to attack Eric Williams. He's, he's actually attacking the concept of that Britain made money for the revolution when Britain policed post-slavery. Which of us is challenging it? Because that is reaching- dead argument. Prof, that's a dead argument. Look how many people have tried to Take down Eric Williams's argument. I know, but what I'm saying is now he's doing it. This is so ridiculous. You know? I, I know, mean, but that's what you're up against. Who who, who is believing that? And uh, uh, policing what? I mean, Britain. Well, first well of, I know. I agree with you. We have but, to uh, mash down this lie that Britain was the first country to abolish the trafficking and so well, on. Let's write a letter to the Spectator. Because Haiti, Haiti stands as a beacon. I agree. Trafficking and ended slavery. And if you want to talk about the European countries, Denmark anyway. Yeah, so, but, what, but I'm saying it's still being written, no matter yes, what we say. Yes, but we are saying it today. We are saying it today. Yeah. Controlling uh, the seas after 1807 was I, I know, I know. It was no moral or humanitarian argument. But I know, but it's in the, spec it's in the spectator today. All right, so guys. somebody has uh, got to challenge it. Final few comments. Um, first of all, <laughs> a couple of thanks. For, uh, Jacqueline Banton was uh, as a West Indian woman living now in Britain who was one of the people who actually came to us first off to actually say, What's, what can we do to help in terms of reparations? And uh, uh, my hat, hat off to her for her and her family for the support they've given us. And some nice comments here as well just come through. Doreen T saying, thank you for this platform. I'm really learning so much tonight. I fully appreciate Professor Palmer <coughs> saying that correct narratives should be added to statues. Um, then Bob Newland, thank you to Lee Day for an amazing webinar of bringing together such a fantastic panel. Dr. Michael Siraj saying, thank you all for a very insightful and wonderful evening. But uh, just to end with my thanks to Varen, to Chris and to Jeff, who've really been Thank you, so brilliant in terms of just the insightful comments, the thoughts, and putting so much time and effort into this. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you all very much indeed for a, a, a lovely couple of hours. Really, really interesting. Thanks, Mark. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure.